Arminian view is that God predestined salvation to those whom he knows will repent and believe. In other words, for the Arminian, it's this. God could see the future. He saw that you would believe in Jesus, so uh, God predestines grace to those people. And you might think, well, I sort of don't like either of those views. Well, those are two views of people trying to figure this thing out. All right? Let's move on. Calvinism teaches that Jesus died only for those whom God predestined. This is called particular atonement. So when Jesus died on the cross, according to Calvinists, not one drop of his blood was spilt for people that wouldn't receive Jesus. He died only for the elect. Only for the saved. Arminians, they teach that Jesus died for all humans, for those who rejected him, as well as those who received him. That's called general atonement. So do you see the idea of where, where the atonement, Jesus' death on the cross, is applied only to people who will become Christians, as opposed to Jesus died on the cross, and it is available to all. Okay, that's the, one of the differences there. Next, Calvinism generally teaches that God's grace is irresistible. You cannot resist God's grace. Why? Because God made the decision before you were even born. I mean, so the logic stands that if, if God made the decision to choose you to be a part of his family before the foundation of the world, if God made that decision for you, then at the moment that the Holy Spirit decides now's the time for you to receive grace you can't resist you will follow christ because god already made the decision arminians teach that god's grace is resistible that when the holy spirit offers you an opportunity to receive god's grace you have the uh, right authority whatever to say no it's not predetermined it's up to you Calvinism generally teaches that faith and repentance are gifts of God. That, why would it have to be a gift? Isn't faith something I do? Isn't repentance something I do? Well, it's a gift because God decided a long time ago that you're going to get saved. And you can't get saved on your own because you are dead in sin, according to Ephesians. You're dead in sin. Dead people don't make decisions. So how do you ever get saved if you're dead? God has to give you the faith. God has to give you the repentance. That's the Calvinistic view. The Arminian view is that faith is the response to the Spirit's work in our life. It's our response. Faith isn't a gift from God. It's our response, the Arminian would say. And then, finally, Calvinism teaches that the elect, those who are chosen before the foundation of the world to receive Christ, the elect, they cannot fall from salvation because God has given them the gift of perseverance. Once saved, always saved, becomes the modern moniker of this. That you can't lose your salvation. If you're truly a Christian, you'll persevere. What about those people that don't persevere? Well, they were never saved in the first place. But true Christians will persevere. Why? Because God made the decision a long time ago. Before the foundation of the world. So you have to persevere. You can't undo what God decided a long time ago. According to the Calvinist. The Arminian would say, no, 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 no. You can lose your salvation. It is possible to apostatize. It is possible for true believers to become unbelievers. It is possible for a true believer, the Arminian would say, to come to a point in his life where he would say, I change my mind. I reject Jesus. And they fall from salvation. 
do you see that generally speaking, the Arminian view is one where there's a lot of emphasis on the human decision. And generally speaking, the Calvinistic view, there's a lot of emphasis on God's decision and salvation. So if you look at some of these and you're like, well, I, I sort of like this from the Calvinistic thing. You know, most people, most Baptists, if they're not strong Calvinists already, they're like, I like, the, I like that last one, that I'm not going to lose my salvation. I like that one. Let's keep that one in my list, you know. Which, it's probably a bad idea to choose your theology based on what you want to happen, you know. But, but nevertheless, you know. So, uh, sometimes if you're first starting out on, on these studies, you're like, I don't know if I can buy into the whole thing, you know, on the Calvinistic side. But there's things I like about it. And then there's other things that I see scripture teaching on the Arminian side. And so I'm somewhere in the middle. Well, these are not the only two views. And when we get to salvation, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit further. Let's talk about God being Father. God is Father. Both the Old and New Testaments, especially Jesus' teachings in the New Testament, they're replete with the idea that God is Father or acts fatherly toward humanity. In the 20th century, many areas of disagreement have risen about around this idea. And here's one of the questions. Is God's fatherhood universal or particular? What does that mean? Is God father to everybody? That's universal. Or is God only father to Christians? Generally speaking, liberal theologians emphasize the universal fatherhood of God. While conservative theologians emphasize that God is father only to those who believe in Jesus. Related to this disagreement is the question of whether God's fatherhood is grounded primarily in creation or in redemption. Because it sort of seems if we're thinking about creation that God is father toward everyone. I mean, God is the father of Adam, right? You know, and so uh, in a sense, God is the father of Adam. And so, and Adam is the father of all of us. So that sort of means that God's like the, the father of everybody, even lost people. So that's sort of this general idea. But the New Testament is pretty clear that, you know, God is father to Christians. So which is it? Well, there's a measure of truth in both positions. God is father of all that we have in Adam for a father. For Adam's, quote, father was God and that God created him. At the same time, there are those believers who, there are the, or excuse me, I should say, those who are believers have a unique father-son relationship with God. So it might be generally correct, yet an oversimplification, to say that God is fatherly toward all, and he is father, with capital F, to believers. Might be an overgeneralization. That's sort of like the way I, sort of the way I sort of think about it. There's a sense in which God is father to all. But there's another sense in which God is specifically father. We know him as father because of, of Christ our belief in Christ. And then this has come up recently. Is the idea of God as Father sexist? I mean, shouldn't we have some, uh, so sing some songs about God being mother? Is this idea of God being Father sexist? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, most contemporary feminist theologians reject the use of paternal Language, pater means father, father uh, type of language in reference to God. It is believed that such language suppresses women and denies their rights. Some have gone so far as to exchange the biblical terminology of God as father by calling him maternal titles. While we freely acknowledge that God is at times likened to a mother, okay, that's, that's true. God wants to bring Jerusalem in uh, like a hen with chicks and things like that. There's, there's that an analogous type of language from time to time. These analogies are far removed from actually describing God as a mother goddess, as was the practice of the civilization surrounding ancient Israel with regard to their, their fertility goddesses. Theologian W.A. Vishatuf, love that, probably mispronouncing that, writes this. I, I like what he writes. He says, God transcends the difference of the sexes. 
We call him Father because Jesus has taught us to do so. And, we, and to cease to call him is to cease to pray as Jesus enjoined us. To refuse to use any reference to God as he, and to choose terms such as the divine being or the deity, is to depersonalize God. We don't want to do that. So we reject some of these modern feminist uh, uh, movements to change essentially, our understanding of the nature of God uh, just based on their sensibilities. Now, let's talk about the Trinity. What does the Bible say? That's the first thing we're going to talk about. The biblical witness to the triune nature of God. We're on page 10 down at the bottom. The concept of the three-in-oneness of God, that's what we're talking about with the Trinity, Three in one. Somehow God is three, somehow he is one. It's three in one when we have this understanding of God. This idea, this concept is not directly and explicitly caught, taught in the Old Testament, but there are very strong clues that suggest the idea is implied. For example, in Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Who's God talking to? Who's the our? Who's the us? Most Christian theologians say, well, God is talking to, you know, there's this, this discussion going on within the Trinity to do this. Jewish theologians, they have the same scripture. They say, no, it's, it, God is speaking in, in plural because he, it, it just represents the, the majesty of God in creation. And then there's a view that says that God is actually speaking to his divine counsel of, of spiritual beings that he created. Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, probably the best view is that, you know, this is an understanding of God, uh, the Trinity, uh, collectively deciding to make man in, uh, in our image, as God says. Then Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 and 4 in, in, on page 11. Listen very carefully to these two verses. And the angel of Yahweh, that's the personal name of God, the angel of Yahweh appeared to him, that's Moses, in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. So who appeared in the midst of the bush? According to verse 2. The angel of Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh in verse 2. What's verse 4 say though? And Yahweh saw that he had turned aside to look. So God called to him from the midst of the bush. Who's in the bush? Is it the angel of God or is it God? That's the angel of God in verse 2, but it's God in verse 4. What's going on? Maybe the angel of the Lord is the Lord. And so there's these hints, these clues, that there might be um, um, multiple persons, if you will, called Yahweh. Now, what does that mean? I mean, isn't that tritheism? Isn't that? We're going to talk about what that might mean in just a minute. Both the Old and New Testament teach that Yahweh is unique. No one is like God. And that Yahweh is the sole deity. There's no one besides God. There's no one like him. He's unique in his attributes. And there's no one other than him. These connected ideas stand in contrast to polytheism, which says there are many gods. The New Testament makes the three in oneness of God explicit by virtue of its teachings about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. What's the Bible say about Jesus? It says this that Jesus is distinct from the Father. The Bible also says that Jesus is divine and one. With the Father. Wait a second. If he's distinct from the Father, how is he one with the Father? Welcome to my world. We're going to try to figure some of this out a little bit. Okay? What about the Holy Spirit? Well, the whole, what's the Bible say there? The Holy Spirit is also distinct from the Father, and he's distinct from the Son. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit also, likewise, we should say, 
is God. So look at that verse, John 14, 26. This is Jesus speaking. He tells his disciples, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Here's Jesus saying, the Father, he's referring to the Father as if the Father is separate or distinct from him. Why? Because the Father is distinct from him. And he's referring to the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit is distinct from him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is distinct from him. And he's referring to the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father. Why? The Father sends the Holy Spirit. And so there's a distinction there. And so we have these, these teachings that we find in the Bible. Now, let's move on to page 12. One of the best ways to understand what you believe is to teach the wrong things and to see why they're wrong. We're going to look at three, three wrong ways of understanding the Trinity, and it's going to provide us some boundaries that we shall not cross, okay? Note, the views that we're about to talk about are heretical. These views and variations of these views are currently held by those who teach a false understanding of God, and the one who knowingly holds to these views may be tantamount to rejecting the Christian faith and the salvation offered by God. In other words, don't do these things. Don't believe these things. Don't be in these, this list. Don't be a Mormon. Don't be a Jehovah's Witness. And don't be a Oneness Pentecostal. That includes the United Pentecostal Church International. All of them explicitly deny the doctrine of the Trinity. They're heretical. And, I mean, you can go to the UPCI website. United Pentecostal Church International. I mean, and, and you can just read right there. They do not believe in the Trinity. So, let's talk about these views. View number one, the Unitarian view. This is the view that Jesus is not God. Here we have on the board, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not actually the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. These are letters on a board. Um, the Unitarian view, what's, uni what's Unitarian? What's unity? Unity is one, right? Okay. So the Unitarian view says that Jesus, the Son, is not God. Only the Father is God. And it claims that God is unipersonal, meaning there's only one person. As we understand the, the Godhead, as we understand who God is, there's only one person right here, and it's the Father. There are no internal differentiations. Unitarian, Unitarianism sacrifices the deity of Jesus Christ and the deity of the Holy Spirit for the unipersonal oneness of God. There are some variations throughout the years like dynamic Monarchianism, which says, oh, well, what's, what, they're trying to deal with, well, what's so special about Jesus then? Well, they came along and they said, well, Jesus was special. He could do all those miracles and everything because he had this power within him. But he's not God, they said. And then you have this view called Arianism. This is not to be confused with Arians like in Hitler's ideas. That's a different thing. Okay, Arianism says that Jesus, the Son, was created by God. So when God created all things, the very first thing he created was the Son. That's wrong. That's bad. Don't believe that thing. Okay? Um, Jehovah's Witnesses are Arians. They believe that Jesus is not divine. Jesus is not God. He was the first created thing, they'll tell you. Mormons 
Latter-day Saints are also Arians. Mormons have a whole lot of invented beliefs, but they do fall in this realm as well. They believe that the Son, Jesus, was created by the Father. Um, then you move on, a couple of, about a thousand years later or more. Socinianism, it says this, Jesus became the adopted Son of God at His ascension. And He had divine function, but not a divine nature. He did a lot of divine things, Socinianism says, but He's not actually God. He became the Son of God when He ascended to heaven, but never when He was here on earth. That's wrong. That's another idea of Unitarianism. And then you have Anglo-American Unitarianism. Jesus is merely a human being through whom some miracles were performed. Ralph Waldo Emerson was, uh, falls in this category. So Unitarianism says only God, the Father, only, fa only the Father is God. That's wrong. That's a boundary you do not go to. You do not cross. Second view, modalism. There are a lot of Baptists that are modalists, unfortunately. A lot of heretical Baptists. I'm not going to have you raise your hand if this is your view. This view affirms that Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and of course the Father, they're all God. Okay, all right. All are God. Okay? Jesus and the Holy Spirit are God, just like God the Father is. However, what distinguishes them is that they operate in different modes. Modalism teaches that there are not personal distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they, these are just ways they appear to us. Sometimes God... We, we think of God as Father. Sometimes we think of God as Son. Sometimes we think of God as the Holy Spirit. But they're not actually, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit don't actually exist as three persons in one God, or one Godhead, we should say. So modalism, what it does, it sacrifices the personal differentiations of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the unipersonal oneness of God. Here are some different modalists. Noetus of uh, Smyrna says, The father submitted to birth, became the son, and then suffered and died. The father became the son. The son became the Holy Spirit. That's what I mean when I say that a lot of Baptists are modalists. A lot of Baptists believe that God the father became flesh. And became the Son. And then when Jesus left, God the Son became the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. No. Wrong. Heresy. Don't go to hell. Don't believe that. Okay? Don't believe, don't knowingly believe that. If you mistakenly believe it, it's one thing. But don't knowingly reject what the scriptures say about the very nature of God. Sibelius, God is essentially one. The Trinity is one of manifestation, but not of essence. The one God became known to humanity in three successive modes. First as Father, then Son, then Holy Spirit. Michael Servetus, God has three dispositions. The Holy Spirit was an angel, and the Word, Jesus, no longer exists. That's a different form. Cyril Charles, Charles Richardson, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are not actually distinct from one another. They're simply ways of thinking about God from different points of view. That's wrong. But you'll hear people say that. Then you have another view, which is also wrong, called tritheism. Here's tritheism. There are three gods. That's basically tritheism. Um, this is wrong too. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three separate beings. Sometimes present day teachers and theologians use language like, well, there's cooperation between the Godhead. That's an unnecessary term. 
Uh, you, you start using language like that, it makes it sound like, oh, sometimes the son's sort of doing his own thing. He's not getting along with the father. I mean, you know, you want to avoid language that, that makes a strong distinction as if there's three separate gods going on. So, a basic understanding of the Trinity on page 13. What will it avail thee to argue profoundly of the Trinity if thou be void of humility and are thereby displeasing to the Trinity? Don't displease the Trinity. All right. So let's talk about the threeness and the three and oneness of God. One of the problems that we encounter, by the way, there's that view, tritheism. Sorry about that. Tritheism on the screen. One of the um, problems that we encounter when we discuss the Trinity is the problem of language. In English, we talk about there being persons. Okay? In Greek, the word used was hypostasis. And theologians like to debate whether our understanding of what a person is is the same as a Greek understanding of what a hypostasis is. So, in what way do we understand the, the, the idea of a person to describe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? However we understand that, however we talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being persons, and it's not improper to talk that way, to talk about there being three persons, Three and one. How, but however we do that, we want to avoid the idea of, that we're talking about three separate gods. Okay? And then the, the oneness in the three and oneness. So here's the, here's the million dollar question. How can there be oneness if there's threeness? What kind of oneness comes to mind? And every different understanding is flawed and, and, and just won't, you can press it too hard and it won't work. But in a mathematical sense, some theologians say that the Godhead is one in the sense of not being fractured. There's no fracture between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Maybe that helps a little bit, I don't know. Other theologians speak in terms of an organic unity in which, if you think of a cell, uh, the, a cell exists by virtue of all of the multiple um, multiplicities within it. Uh, maybe that works a little bit. Maybe it helps a little bit to understand. But none of these understandings, none of these understandings can speak to the unfathomable mystery. The one thing we can be sure of is that we can see God's unity, the unity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when God is at work. And there's a quote here, but it basically says, when the Father was at work, the Son was at work too. And so was the Spirit. And so, who created the world? Well, the Father created the world, right? Right? Scripture is very clear that the Father created the world through the Son. And what do you read is happening in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? We all know Genesis 1, 1. Genesis 1, 1. Uh, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What happened in verse 2? And the Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. Well, right there, there's the Spirit of God at work as well. So the Son and the Spirit are involved in God's work of creation. When, when, uh, when Jesus, uh, when the Son, we call him Redeemer. Does that mean that the Father is excluded from the work of redemption? No. This Holy Spirit, is he, is he uh, excluded from the work of redemption? No. All three are at work, even though we call the Son our Redeemer. And the Holy Spirit, uh, he is the one who sanctifies us throughout our lives, makes us more like Christ. Is the Father excluded? Is the Son excluded from that work? No. Okay? So we see the unity of God when God is at work. Does that explain every last question you have? No. 
nor mine. The Trinity and Christians today. The doctrine of the Trinity is one teaching the most Baptist, Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholics share. We reject the heresies promoted by Unitarian Universalists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Latter-day Saints. As Christians, we are to worship the one God. We are to worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we must be careful not to neglect or de-emphasize the Trinity in our theological studies, congregational worship, or personal devotions. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Which, which member of the Trinity do Baptists talk about most? You can say it. Jesus. You know, we have bumper stickers. It's all about Jesus. And it should be all about Jesus. In a sense. What did Jesus say the Holy Spirit's role is? To point people to, to, to Him, to the Son. It should be about Jesus. But if we're not careful... And we, if we react against an overemphasis by, let's say, charismatics on the Holy Spirit, if we overreact against charismatics on the Holy Spirit, um, then, then we begin to ignore the Holy Spirit and His work. And that's not good. Or, both Catholic, or excuse me, both uh, uh, Baptists and charismatics have a tendency to ignore the Father, especially when it comes to ignoring one of his uh, greatest works, the work of creation. And so, when we worship God, when we, when we praise God, when we have our devotions, uh, we need to be mindful of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work. Now, Every diagram, every analogy, I know, I've heard the egg analogy. I've heard the cloverleaf analogy. I've heard all the analogies. They all break down, okay? And this drawing that I'm about to make is going to break down too, okay? But many of you have seen this, and we're going to end with this. Well, almost. I should have made this bigger. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. Or the other way. The Father is not the Son. Nor is the Son the Father. And the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Okay? And you can find this drawing made a lot better than my handy artwork. Um, but if you want a general understanding of the Trinity, it's that. Father, Son, and Spirit is God. They have the same nature. They are also distinct from one another. Okay? By the way, don't call the Holy Spirit it. He is a he. He is a person, not a force. Okay? Final thing, I would just point you to uh, a couple of things. The, the biography. Um, on the back, a couple of books, both named The Doctrine of God, might be good. Knowing God by J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer is a, he's a reformed, which means sort of Calvinistic theologian, but he's really good read. He's really good read. And he, he doesn't try to force a lot, of, a lot of things, but this idea of knowing God is really good. Carl F.H. Henry is probably the most, probably the best Baptist theologian of the last century. <clears throat> there's a new book by Matthew Barrett called Simply Trinity, The Unmanipulated Father, Son, and Spirit, you know, where he, he uh, talks about the essence of the Trinity, but also talks about 
this tendency that we have uh, to uh, not discuss all three members of the Godhead. And finally, Antony Flew, um, there is a God, how the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. This is him, talking about himself. And so if you're wondering about a book about the existence of God, uh, that might be beneficial to you. Also in your biography, or not after the biography, you should have some appendices uh, there, including a rather lengthy article on um, the Jewish doctrine of the Trinity and the idea that uh, Jews, other than Jesus, in Jesus' day, in the first century and before, actually, uh, actually believed that there was more than one person or persona going on in the Hebrew Scriptures that they could call Yahweh. And so you might find that an interesting read, a few, as well as um, a couple of other articles. But.